Hello, everyone. Um, I am Becky Bartovix, and I am a volunteer for the chapter. And I don't think you can see me for some reason, but um, anyway, that doesn't matter. Um, I, I um, we, can, we can see you, Becky. Oh, you can? Okay, there's a funny little thing in my screen. Um, so uh, I've been involved with Sierra Club for a long time. I live on what is known as North Haven Island, which is in Penox stolen Penobscot territory. Um, and um, I am so happy to introduce you to Nikki Sakara. Um, she is just an incredible advocate for um, water justice in the state of Maine. She's um, the co-founder of Community Water Justice that's based in the Saco River watershed in Freiburg. Um, and uh, she, uh, Community Water Justice was formed in 2012 when Nestle Waters North America attempted to secure a U.S. Uh, precedent-setting contract with the Freiburg Water Company that would have lasted up to 45 years for their Poland Springs brand bottled water. Um, her organization is focused on keeping stewardship of the water commons in the hands of the public and out of privatized corporate exploits to ensure a healthy environmental birthright for our future generations. Keep your eyes on Nikki on this. Nikki has been an educator in the fields of wilderness education and wilderness medicine for over 25 years. She spent eight years doing human rights advocacy on Capitol Hill. She served as a trustee on the water, uh, the Freiburg Water District, is the founding board member of the Saco Headwaters Alliance. She's a member of the Sunlight Media Collective, a youth mentor in fostering leadership for the next generation. And she is the single mo mother of Luke Sakara, who engages with her on um, work. And he's actually been a volunteer on our political team. Um, and I am happy to introduce Nikki. Thank you. Thank you so much, Becky, for that introduction. And thanks for hosting this talk. Uh, it's just pretty um, serendipitous that during this time, uh, we're looking at a big transfer of water wealth. Um, as you may have already heard that um, the Poland Spring brand and Nestle Waters North America was just purchased by a pair of private equity firms. But before I dive into that, um, oh, Nikki, you just got muted somehow. Okay, <laughs> well, slight, where did I where did I get cut off? <laughs> um, about like ten seconds ago. <laughs> okay, so not very long. All right, but um, however, I'm just going to back up and give a little bit of historical context um, before I talk about um, the the recent acquisition, uh, because I, I don't, I'm not sure where everybody's um, understanding is at as part of this call. So um, I think you can go to the, the slide number two. So um, here in Maine, uh, it's sometimes hard to see the global water crisis from our backyards. Uh, Maine, we're very fortunate here in Maine to have copious amounts of water. Um, and it's so it's really hard for us to understand the crisis that's looming. But to understand that, um, we should note that the World Economic Forum says that water scarcity is one of the largest global risks in terms of potential impact over the next decade. Um, an estimated 35% of the world's population lacks access to clean drinking water. And by 2025, about 1.8 billion people will be living in countries or regions with absolute water scarcity. And two thirds of the world population could be living under water stressed conditions. And again, that's only uh, four to five years away. So, um, and another thing to think about is, you know, the global population on this earth has doubled since I was born in 1970 and may double again in much less time. And so this leads us to many questions and, you know, will putting a price on our water make it further inaccessible to only those can afford it? And, you know, through the commodification in water and privatization, um, there's a lot of inherent risks that come along with that. So. Maine is positioned in a period of time where um, we could change the course of this trajectory. And so um, I think you can go to the next slide. Thank you. 
slide number three. Has it right. not changed on your oh, screen? Here it is, getting out. <laughs> little delayed. <laughs> Out here in Freiburg, our connection can be a little wonky. So yeah. Um, so yeah. Um, so why are privatizers like Nestle Water um, looking at Maine? And um, I think, you know, the reason that we have a lot of good, clean uh, water sources is an important one. But um, we have sand and gravel aquifers that were left here from the last ice age, which creates a great filtration system for freshwater sources. Um, our legal infrastructure here in Maine is out of date and it's easily take advantage of, especially with, um, you know, corporations like Nestle or other corporate interests we see in our state house, uh, the lobbying power of in certain industrial blocks are pretty impressive and that those voices can be really hard to overcome. Um, our proximity to global markets through our ports on the Atlantic Ocean is another reason. And also the branding of Maine's pristine forest and waters that romanticizes through marketing uh, creates an unparalleled appeal. So all of these things um, make Maine favorable and open to, to exploits. Now, um, Maine is approximately uh, 35,000 um, square miles total. And our sand and gravel aquifers occupy about 1,300 square, square miles of that total. And our average annual recharge to those aquifers is about 240 billion gallons. Now that sounds like a lot of water um, but let's put something into context here for perspective. The Portland Water District, which is Maine's largest public water supply, um, serves 200,000 people total and businesses, and they consume over 8.5 billion gallons annually. And uh, currently what Nestle takes is over a billion gallons, but that equals about 850 gallons per person per year. And the, you know, the significant thing about Nestle is they're removing that water from our local hydrological cycle. And we don't have studies that have been done to um, educate us on the potential long-term impacts of the removal of that water from our hydrological cycle. Um, another thing to think about in, in this context is uh, about 50% of precipitation in the state of Maine is runoff. So it'll fill our lakes and streams and rivers and go out to the ocean. 40% of that evaporates and only 10% or less infiltrates to recharge our groundwater. So, you know, you can see like during times of drought, uh, the, the, the removal from our hydrological cycle due to bulk water mining and exports can really exacerbate um, the effects of drought. And we need to keep our eye on that. I'm curious, um, you know, these are some, some questions to think for yourself. I know because um, we're all muted right now and a lot of us don't have cameras, but, you know, I'm curious, like how many of us get our local tap water from a pub? public water system or you know so the question to ask yourself is you know does your water come from a public water system or do you have a drilled well and out of those that might have their own well is it a drill or or dug well and so people with dug wells are at more of a risk of uh, going dry obviously especially in the areas where water is being extracted you can go to the next slide All right, let me see here. So, um, Poland Spring as a company, um, they were first a small water company that was started in 1859 by a family of proprietors based in Poland, Maine. Um, they understood the quality of the water of the spring was exemplary due to the indigenous Abenaki's ancestral knowledge that they capitalized upon. 
In 1907, um, an upgraded state-of-the-art bottling facility produced 450 cases per day and was served to the elite in social circles of that time. And then later in 1980, Perrier bought Poland Springs, which was soon acquired by Nestle Waters in 1992. And since that time, Nestle has grown their brand exponentially to three plastic bottling facilities in Western Maine and that mines water from 10 different towns. The bottling facility in Hollis is boasted to be the second largest in the world, which produces over uh, 200,000 cases of 24 bottles, you know, the 16 ounce bottles per day from that one location alone. Um, Nestle, I think I'd mentioned, exports over a billion gallons per year now from our aquifers. And let's see, let's quickly, can you quickly switch to slide number 10? Sorry about that. Yeah, just to move forward on that. So th here's a map and um, of the locations that Nestle uh, mines and exports water from currently. Um, let's see. They are the towns of Poland, Freiburg, Kingfield, St. Albans, Pierce Pond Township, Dallas Plantation, Hollis, Denmark, and most recently added in the past couple of years is Rumford and Lincoln. Now, Poland, Kingfield, and Hollis currently have bottling plants. And they, um, before Nestle sold uh, their, um, their their brands to um, the private equity firms, they were looking to build a forest bottling facility. Uh, and, and, re and just this past year, um, the Poland Spring brand has a sub brand called Poland Springs Origin that they just started marketing to the Western states. So it's a, it's a water that can now be found in California. So. So they're really, we're looking and pushing to expand the Poland Spring brand because it, it was the, it's the number one selling SKU in all of metropolitan New York. And it's their, it was their fastest growing brand and most popular spring water brand. Okay, let's see, let's go back to um, slide number five. And many of you have heard about the Supreme Court case. Um, you know, we put Freiburg on the map a number of years ago when our community tried to block a US precedent setting contract that would give the Nestle Corporation the upper hand of control over our groundwater for the next 45 years. Um, this was done without the consent of local people. And because this contract honored an agreement between two private corporations, the citizens ultimately had no say in this matter. Um, we took the case all the way up to the Supreme Court and the biggest lesson we learned was that it was not within the purview of the Maine Public Utilities Commission to consider environmental factors in considering contracts, even in long-term contracts such as ours. So that's a big hole that we have um, in our regulatory process that won't consider these environmental impacts. So, and water bottling isn't the only water extractive business prospect that comes with concern. Um, I think that, you know, we're seeing other uh, industries, particularly agriculture in our food systems. Um, you know, it's been determined through the United Nations that decentralizing our food systems is going to be the pathway forward to um, feeding ourselves in the future uh, because of the impacts of centralizing our food systems and the amount of water consumption that it takes and the waste that happens and also shipping food all around the globe isn't sustainable. So um, we really need to focus on water conservation with the through the ways that we engage in agriculture in the local level. And so, and I know Becky and some other people here have been involved in, you know, the on-land fish farms and the amount of fresh water from, their, from our aquifers that they consume. So that's another potential impact that we need to be really concerned about. And so, you know, what does water protection look like in your community? 
Um, you can go to number six really quick. So in your community, it might look like electing a water conservationist to your local water district. It could look like following waste regulations to protect your water sources. Um, it could look like adopting a local water ordinance or installing water bottle filling stations in public venues so we're not uh, buying bottled water. And here in Freiburg and other frontline communities fighting water privatization, it might look just a little bit different. So you can go to slide 11. So by privatizing water and sewer systems, local government officials abdicate control over a vital public resource. Privatization limits public accountability. Multinational water corporations are primarily accountable to their stockholders, not to the people they serve. Losing public input on how our water allocations will go will not ensure our future water security. So now we can look at um, you know, another growing competing interest. And I wanted to bring this up before we talk about this acquisition because how water privatization corporations interact each, with each other is going to uh, have a great impact on us in Maine. So um, see, I'm, for the people that are just listening in, um, right now I'm showing a map. I'm sorry, I should be better um, catering to the people who don't have um, cameras on right now. But I'm showing a map of the state of Maine, which shows the 10 communities that Nestle takes water from. And I'm also showing a map, and those are in blue for the other people that can see. Um, and the communities that are in orange, those are the communities where the Maine Water Company currently pulls water from. Um, so the Maine Water Company um, operates in more than 20 towns in the state of Maine, and they have purchased municipal water systems. Um, so uh, is there anybody, if there's anybody on the call that's from a Maine Water Company town, um, I'd be curious to, to know. Um, but Maine Water Company is actually not a Maine company at all. They are part of Connecticut Water Company and um, they just went through a billions dollar merger with San Jose Water Company, which has elevated them to the third largest private water utility in the United States. They're on the New York Stock Exchange and they run water systems in let's see, California, in Texas, in Florida, in Connecticut, and in Maine. And um, this is another concern because as we saw with the contract between our local, you know, the Freiburg Water Company, which is a privately run company in corporations like Nestle, the townspeople didn't have any input into um, that deal. So, you know, with with more private interest in our state, um, our water sovereignty is going to be at risk because the, the potential of it being locked up through private deals um, to be shipped around the world um, is going to be a, an increasing problem. So, oops, I just kicked my tea over. <laughs> I'll have to clean that up later. Um, let's see. Let's go to, let's see, let's start talking about One Rock Capital. You can go to slide number 16. So on December 7th, yeah, go to, yeah, you got it. So on December 7th, uh, 2020, uh, for the first time in history, uh, water futures were being traded on the stock market. This raises the alarms for many reasons, um, because going, you know, towards water privatization on that level um, here in Maine, we're at great risk because, as you see, with all of the prospects of water privatization we have in our state, um, 
you know, how future water allocations are going to go are going to depend on the stock market as opposed to genuinely conserving our water at the local level for local needs. And as we all know, shipping water around the world to um, solve local water problems is not a solution. It's extremely unsustainable and it, it's going to um, funnel wealth up to the global elite. Um, and there's, yeah, for local agricultural purposes, you know, what we're going to be seeing in California now that uh, water futures are being traded on the stock market is that agricultural interests are going to be at bidding wars potentially with outfits like bottled water companies to export water. And our, I, uh, I know a lot of our farmers here in Maine won't be able to afford to outbid corporations like Nestle. So let's see. And then in, on, so on December 7th, um, water was traded on the stock market for the first time in history. And then on um, February, the second week in, in February, um, Nestle announced that they were in negotiations with One Rock Capital and Metropolis and Company. There were a pair of private equity firms and uh, Metropolis, he's a billionaire. Um, uh, he's a Greek American gentleman um, based in the United States now, and they just bought the Playboy Mansion. That's kind of an interesting fact of who they are. And um, they have bought and sold, um, let's see, Hostess Twinkies. <laughs> they, they buy failing brands and try to get them to perform again. So a notable recent company that they bought and turned around was Twinkies. So they are of Twinkie fame and also Paps Blue Ribbon. Uh, One Rock Capital, they are an actual, they're a group of corporations actually, and they include uh, plastic producers, uh, people connected with the oil industry, chemical industries, and also Mitsubishi. Um, Mitsubishi is a Japanese corporation. You've probably heard of their, about the, you know, their cars most notably. Um, but they also own the majority of shares of large privatized water systems in Asia and Africa. So that's who they are. Um, now, they are now doing business as Blue Triton Brands. And this is brand new information. Um, so they're new corporate formation is Blue Triton. So we're gonna to have to keep our name out for them in Maine. So it's Nestle Waters, North America, Metropolis and One Rock Capital Partners doing business as Blue Triton. Now, what we don't know is how much like stock or investments Nestle still has in this new corporate formation. Um, there was a Blue Triton representative that just gave a presentation out in Colorado. And when we were asking, you know, when people were asking pointed questions, they were, they were felt like they were really dodging them. So there is a level of opaqueness to what their corporate structure actually is. Um, I did communicate with Senator Bennett, who's been really helpful. He's our new Senator out here in District 19. Um, and he has his own concerns and we've work, been working together a little bit to uh, glean more information from this new corporate formation, Blue Triton. And some of the questions that we wrote to them about is, are, let's see, um, you know, what corporate form is Blue Triton and under what jurisdiction is it organized? Who are the underlying owners of Blue Triton and who is the controlling party? What business, what is the business purpose of the acquisition? And what is your exit strategy? And what we mean by exit strategy, you know, when, when private equity firms, you know, buy companies like this, they really have a short runway, you know, from the time that they buy it, from the time that they flip it to make money. So we're interested also to hear what their exit strategy is during the time that they are taking ownership over our, our water. Um, 
and in the transaction or any part of the transaction subject to regulatory approval at any level of government. What assets relating to Poland Spring were ac acquired in the transaction and what assets were, if any, were not acquired. And with that question, we were kind of concerned about, um, you know, whether all the land and the permits that go with the withdrawals would actually be held by Nestle. Um, because in original information that the companies were putting out, it was stating that um, the private equity firms would be acquiring the offices and the, the infrastructure and the brand name, but it wasn't talking about the land and the permits at the time. So, um, you know, will Blue, Blue Triton seek to change any contracts, including those related to water sources or operations of interest to main communities? And what kinds of changes might be expected? Um, who are the principal officers of Blue Triton? Um, and I'll get to that in a minute because just yesterday afternoon, um, I did get a little bit more information about that. And let's see. So yeah, anyway, we have a host of questions and we're thankful for Senator Bennett for um, helping us with these questions and reaching out to them directly because um, they're more likely, they're more apt to listen, ask, you know, respond to a Senator than they are um, community groups with concerns. So he'll, he'll keep working on us with that. You can go to slide number 17. Thank you. So this was um, pulled off of this image is um, it has two columns, you know, on the left, we see Nestle Waters North America. And on the right, we see Blue Triton brands and then a list of, um, you know, CFOs and VPs listed underneath. And so as you'll see, between you know just these positions, um, there's very little change, except you know the chairman obviously is no longer Steve Presley. It's going to be Dean Metropolis, so he's going to be the chairman and interim CEO of Blue Triton Brands. But here, I think they're trying to create the appearance as there's very little change in their structure. Um, but you know, there, this doesn't really explain, um, you know, what portion that Nestle might still have control over. Um, I can say that back in 2018 in Brazil, Nestle did a similar thing where, because of public pressure mounting against Nestle, it was damning, damaging their public image. So they sold to a company but maintained a majority of control over that. So to them, it was a strategy of changing the face of their business. Um, so another company could do the bidding for them and look like the bad guy when in actuality, Nestle's investments still kept them in control. So when we talk about Blue Triton, I'm still gonna be talking about Nestle slash Blue Triton because they're in there, but we just don't know uh, to what level yet. It's not clear. So um, let's see, you can go to slide 18 really quickly. So as we're trying to figure out this new corporate formation, you know, they give us a diagram like this, which really doesn't answer all of our questions. Um, so as you can see, um, they have, again, Nestle listed on the left and Blue Triton on the right. And it's just, it's not really telling us um, who the actual investors are because as you may or may not understand, private equity firms has a lot of corporate stakeholders within um, those firms. And so uh, we don't know, you know, where Nestle might still be at in all of this. Um, because that could also, depending on, you know, their, their stake that they're still maintaining with this new corporate formation, 
um, might give us a clue as to who might be buying this corporation next. So, you know, Nestle um, claimed that they were selling it due to their brands weren't performing as they needed them to. But we also know that Nestle's taken some huge hits within their you know, public relations due to uh, lawsuits over their groundwater extraction, um, due to the plastic pollution that they create. As you may have heard, you know, for three years in a row, they were listed as one of the top plastic polluters in the globe. And that's really harmed their reputation. So, you know, some people are thinking maybe that this is just a ploy to um, try to, you know, get their uh, image back in a place where it needs to be while making their water brands more profitable. And, um, you know, Metropolis and Company is notorious for doing that, is squeezing profits from uh, um, un, you know, less performing brands. So I think with that, we can expect to see, here, let me pull up. I um, was doing some research the other day on this, but I think we can um, expect to see them um, doing layoffs. I know with the Hostess, you know, Twinkies brand, they laid off, gosh, they had over 8,000 employees total and they laid off everybody except for 1,200 employees. Um, that's a huge jump. I know in Maine, Nestle, uh, they, they employ about between 800 and 900 people, they say. Um, I've never been able to get a list of what the, those employment uh, numbers actually look like and where the jobs are within that 800 to 900. Uh, I know that it includes like seasonal and part-time employees and also a lot of their truck drivers aren't from the state of Maine at all. It includes their, you know, senior executives who aren't even in Maine, but um, it'll be interesting to see how that will affect the job numbers. Um, since they're looking to make things more profitable. And also um, bottled water is one of the most automated industries that exists. And it act, you know, as far as the amount of resources they're extracting from us, they give us very little in the way of jobs in return. Um, and there's, I know technology has gotten, it has been quote unquote improved since the times that they've built their bottling plants in Maine and so, you know, with new technologies put in, it, they'll probably need fewer workers, I would imagine. All right, where are we for time? Okay, I think, um, okay, you can go to slide 19. And some of you may have heard about um, Nestle being sued. Uh, there's a current legal case against Nestle for fraudulent lab labeling of their Poland Spring brand. Um, and the case was brought forth by five individuals in a class action lawsuit. And th they're claiming that it's not spring water at all. They're claiming that the water is, comes from a drilled well nearby the spring site. And here in Freiburg, I, knew, I do know that to be true, um, but somehow they've been able to get around the definition of spring water here in the state. And that's really interesting because, um, well, I, I'm sh right now also I'm showing a photo of Evergreen Spring that's in Freiburg, Maine. And for those of you that can see the picture, you can see the pump house, the little stone building that's nearby, and you can see the spring, which, you know, it's that's not a natural spring, as you can tell, because it's built up surrounding some water that's coming to the surface. But in the lawsuit, it claims that that spring doesn't naturally exist. And it wasn't found on maps prior to them being here. And um, so it's claiming that it's the, th this whole photograph that you're seeing that the spring in the foreground is actually um, a fraudulent claim. Um, so you can go to slide 20. So in the lawsuit, and as we know, you know, Maine's 
regulatory system is compromised due to many conflicts of interest. Uh, Nestle has what we call regulatory capture in the state of Maine, where they've gained positions on our Board of Environmental Protection. Um, they've gained a position on the Maine Drinking Water Program and also the Maine Public Utilities Commission when they were overseeing our Supreme Court case at the state level. And as you know, we were going through the process with the Maine Public Utilities Commission of, of um, approving the 45 year contract, all of the commissioners, all three of them had ties to Nestle, including the public advocate um, in, in the Utilities Commission office. So, and it took us over a year and a half to get them to all recuse themselves from our case because they all had ties to Nestle. Now, um, so the public relies on our state regulatory officials to ensure compliance with the standard of the identity for spring water. And while Maine's governing statute has adopted FDA spring water identity standards, Maine has established a regulatory structure designed to ensure compliance with it. But Maine has not properly enforced compliance against Nestle waters. The state's failure to do so has resulted in a large measure because Nestle has manipulated and compromised Maine's regulatory process. And I got this information from the actual lawsuit that's stating all of this. So Maine the bottled water industry is regulated by several agencies, including the DEP, the Department of Agriculture and Conservation, and the Department of Health and Human Services. And so that and the Health and Human Services includes Maine Drinking Water Program. Um, groundwater extraction permits and unorganized or deorganized townships and plantations such as you know, Pierce, pa uh, Pierce Pond Township and Dallas Plantation, they are unorganized. Um, they have been granted by LERC, which is um, the, um, the Land Use and Regulation Commission prior to 2012. And since 2012, uh, the Land Use Planning Commission um, gives authors permission. Um, and then you know, with respect to organized townships, such as, you know, Hollis and Denmark and Kingfield, um, they go through the DEP or by the DHHS, which acts upon the recommendation of the drinking water program staff. So since 2005, these agencies have cooperated to eliminate redundancies in their regulatory responsibility by allocating certain responsibilities exclusively to one agency. Pursuant to that scheme, responsibility for evaluating compliance with sp the spring water identity standard lies exclusively with the drinking water program, whose environmental engineers, hydrologists, and staff members are alone responsible for ensuring compliance with the spring water identity standard in Maine. So I think that really tells a story, um, you know, with them being sued and it going to the main drinking water program that's allowed that standard. And as, as some of you may know, Thomas Brennan, he is the Nestle Waters North America Senior Resource Manager that sat on the main drinking water program for, for many years. And interesting enough, I just discovered that he just took a job with um, American Aquaculture, who's uh, proposing uh, huge fish farms in Frenchman's Bay, which is seeing a lot of resistance because of the complications and the environmental impacts that those type of fish farms create. Um, anyway, let's see, we're running out of time. So quickly, you can go to slide 21. And I want to leave you with um, what you can do. <laughs> And so this is a list I'll read them for the people that are listening in. You know, first and foremost, we can limit our consumption of bottled water. You know, we can use water filters and refillables in its place. Uh, run for municipal office. That's really important because we need as many people who are concerned about our water sources and protecting them appropriately. We need them to step up and take positions of power. You can serve on your local water district. 
Um, interesting enough, I did some research a few years back and on average, there's between three and five open positions on most municipalities in the state of Maine. So whether it's a select person or um, there's positions like on the planning board you could take up or conservation commit commissions. Um, a lot of conservation committees in the state of Maine in municipalities have gone inactive, I've noticed. So look, and if you don't have a conservation committee, see if one, there's infrastructure for one to exist. And we had a group of people here in Freiburg um, just revive ours a few years ago. And it's super helpful to have them active and part of our local government. Uh, you can adopt a local water protection ordinance super important. If um, you don't know if your town has a water protection ordinance, go to the town office and ask for it. It should be posted on your town's website, but often I find that they don't exist there. So you can call your town office and check it out and see what um, look, um, your local protections look like. Um, the town of Shapley, you can refer to their um, town ordinance, but they've adopted a really strong model ordinance that you can look at. You can also email me and we can have talks about what a good protection ordinance can look like for your community. Um, definitely pressure our elected officials to maintain public stewardship and not to commodify or privatize main water. So it's really important that we all engage our elected officials on this do it often because we need to really make more noise about this growing problem. Um, support progressive water policies for future generations. Uh, we, we did have a bill going in this session, but it unfortunately came back from the revisor's office, not in the spirit of the bill that we were intended, which raises a lot of questions about why the revisor's office would not give, would, um, not give us protections against private water utilities. So I think that their revision raises more questions than confidence. And so uh, we'll hopefully be investigating that in the next, in the next month or so. Um, yeah, and also question institutions and organizations with conflicts of interest. Um, Nestle has a lot of power. They're not real. I don't see that they're leaving our state, but they have a lot of investments in research um, with the University of Maine and the University of New England, University of Southern Maine. Uh, it's really interesting to see how um, they are shaping the, our, our science base in the state of Maine and with the amount of uh, money that they give and the amount that they have their hands in, uh, you know, hydrological studies in the state of Maine, it has the appearance that they have scientific capture in the state. So we really need to question that. Um, but let me stop there and open it up for questions because I could go on and on about this, but uh, I'm more interested in how your questions might guide conversation from here. Thank you. Thanks, Nikki. Um, there were yeah. I, there are a lot of questions in or a few questions in the chat. Okay. Um, but I had one just re you recently mentioned, um, you know, the language of the bill was changed in the revisor's, revisor's office. Is there a bill number? And, well, um, and we it, actually, yeah, let me actually, we decided to kill the bill. Okay. And so the bill was it would limit any um, any utility, any uh, water system utility from engaging in a permit for bulk water um, extraction and exports, it limit them to a five year maximum permit. Okay. So, right. Um, you know, for the reason why Nestle got away with being able to secure a 45 year contract, which is irresponsible. Um, we wanted to limit that to a maximum of five years, which is competent and reasonable. Actually, personally, I don't think it should be over two years, maybe one, but 
through, I had to think like through the state's perspective, what they're going to think competent and reasonable. And because comprehensive plans also go on five-year cycles and, and updating and renewing everything, um, you know, I would advocate personally for like a two-year maximum, but maximum. you know, and I'm thinking that this 45-year contract is really an anchor for hedge funders, mm. right? So when you're selling water futures, you need something like that to anchor investments and to attract investments. And so we have to stop playing their game uh, with our water in that way, because over the central part of our aquifer, we also have a land holding company for Bank of America um, that abuts the property that Nestle owns. So, and to give you a snapshot, um, so Nestle owns about 20,000 acres across the US and that's what gives them access um, you know, to, to um, the rights to the water in a lot of places or it gives them a little conservation easement to protect their future profits. Um, so 6,000 of those 20,000 acres are in the state of Maine and 3,000 of those 6,000 are in the Saco River watershed alone. So it kind of tells a story about where they're really focusing on. And I had heard uh, Kim, Dref Kim Jeffries, who was the CEO of Nestle Waters North America a number of years ago, I heard him giving um, a radio interview and he was talking about how he was going to manage the White Mountain, <laughs> the, the White Mountain watershed, the, the watershed in the White Mountains here. So they have their sights on Maine, you know, Nestle or Blue Triton, they have a hundred year plan for Maine or Nestle more than Blue Triton because they're going to flip it. But, but Maine doesn't have a hundred year plan for Maine. You know, we are woefully, we're caught with our pants down, <laughs> so to speak. It's, it's really sad. Yeah. I think Marianne had her hand up. Can you, can you be unmuted? Can you unmute? I'm unmuted. Okay. Uh, one question was, yeah. Will the pine tree amendment help us fighting Nestle's? I would love to think that it does. And I love the spirit of the pine tree amendment. Um, my concern is that because, you know, because this gives us the, you know, the human right to clean air, clean water and a healthy existence, super important. And it's valuable. And I, I can't wait to see where that might have its place in, in helping us advance our environmental goals in the state of Maine. One thing that concerns me about it is because money is speech and corporations are currently people, mm. that, would, that doesn't give us protections in the way I think we would hope them to. Uh, so I'm I have concerns about that because the only way that to give it legal legs, I think, is to give rights natures to, it, to exist. Currently, nature does not have rights to exist in our constitution and our whole economy, all of our health is tied to that. And so we're really shooting ourselves in the foot without making it a nature centric um, piece. Not to say that the Green Amendment might be helpful and I hope that it will. And, and, and regardless, I think it's a step in the right direction of acknowledging that. Um, and of course, you know, big changes don't happen overnight. And so um, while I love the work that's being done on that, I think it's important because it stimulates conversations that are critical. Um, I'm just, you know, I'm just very interested to see how that might give us some a legal basis to right. you know, correct our course, so to speak. Yeah. States, the states need more legal rights over the resources of the state, you know, across the country. You mean on a more localized basis? Well, I mean, that nationally, states don't have much control over uh, corporations who want to extract oil or what, or water or whatever. Right. So, yeah, no, they definitely have protections that... <laughs> And hopefully um, there is a, an investigation into the bottled water industry that the um, House Committee on Oversight and Reform had started prior to uh, the pandemic happening. And so last March, I was supposed to go and testify in front of Congress to you know, my experiences and, and what we're seeing in Maine with the bottled water industry. And unfortunately, 
Uh, they canceled just a few days before the hearing because the government shut down. And so right now we're trying to get them to resume that investigation. And so, you know, things are pretty busy still with the pandemic and it's, we've been pushing, 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 but um, yeah, um, you know, Rashida Tlaib, you may have heard of her. She's really great. She represents Michigan and the problems they've having there, but we've been uh, in close contact with, with her about um, resuming this and other committee members, but yeah. So there's, thank you. Um, there is a question from Bonnie. Um, Bonnie, do you want to ask it or do you want me to ask it? You can unmute yourself. Can unmute myself. Yes. Uh, I just, uh, we moved to Maine a half a year ago from San Bernardino County, California, where Arrowhead, yeah. Nestle's Arrowhead was. Um, and we were in extreme drought conditions uh, in Southern California when we left. And we arrived in Maine and discovered that the Maine was in drought conditions too. And I was just wondering, um, I mean, Arrowhead was taking water illegally and was causing uh, all the towns in the area, uh, which is on a mountain, to uh, not have enough water for their population. Does yeah. the Nestle, does this extraction have anything to do with the drought conditions in Maine? I mean, since we've been here, we've seen rainfall and there's water all over the place. So, yeah, what's causing Great. that? Yeah, well, I'm glad that you're asking that question. I was just on the phone with my friends in San Bernardino yesterday. Oh. <laughs> so, yeah, well, welcome to Maine. And, Thank you. Uh, yeah, this issue hasn't gone away from you, and I'm sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, um, but I, I also have the connection that my parents used to live in Denmark, and my oh. kids went to Freiburg Academy somewhere along the line. So, oh, great. And my son is exactly your age, so you might have. I don't know. Anyway, oh, very cool. But that's beside the point. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's awesome. Um, well, actually, if you want to pop up slide eight, yeah. Um, so San Bernardino is awesome. They just sent a cease and desist order to Nestle um, because they'd been pulling illegally out of um, the national forest there for so long. They didn't even have a right to be there. No, no. But finally, after years and years and years, <laughs> they're getting the boot and they have the legal basis to do so. And I think because, you know, Nestle is, you know, selling off their wa water brands, it, it just created an opportunity for this conversation to happen to finally kick them to the curb. So they could be successful in this, but, you know, we're, we're looking at probably a few year long battle uh, legally anyway with that. So um, we just put up a picture of Round Pond. Now Round Pond is over the central part of our aquifer here in Maine. And this is, you know, taken on a summer day. Uh, you know, I got it from Google Maps. It's just a screenshot from Google Maps. And you can see how the water line, you can see how it's shallow along the edges, but you can see where the water line is and it goes almost up to the tree line, right? And can you show the, the next slide? So here's Round Pond right now. So the top photo was taken on April 9th. And, um, oops, that's a text error. And um, yeah, you can see that um, because we've had poor snowpack this past winter, um, you can see that the water line is very, very low. Um, I had wanted to get a drone shot of this, but because this pond is close to a small airstrip, it would be illegal for us to fly a, a drone to do a direct comparison from that last image. But there's places around this pond now that are 40 feet um, of, of exposed shoreline from the waterline. So, so, and you can see in the second photo, that's a measurement marker that's used to collect water level, uh, water level data. And it's fully exposed. It's not even in the water anymore. So um, 
our local like Luigi Geological Services from Freeport, Maine, uh, they're an independent hydrogeologic consulting firm. Uh, they've been contracted by Nestle Waters uh, to collect and compile hydraulic data for, for the Wardsbrook Aquifer here in Freiburg. But the data that they collect from Round Pond isn't included. And so they've uh, gotten away without including the data. And you can see the impacts on this pond and they haven't been up to normal yet levels except maybe during the flood stage from a very short period but these photos are here are from our flood stage here this year and i've never seen them that low and i go to this pond somewhat frequently because it is an indicator it's a spring fed pond right over the central part of our aquifer so it tells a story um so we're keeping our eyes on this. So the impacts of drought, you know, like I said, to localized regions where they take water from, there can be exacerbated impacts. But for us to prove that it's Nestle doing it, we have to come up with a science. So the burden of proof is on the landowners and not Nestle to prove that it has anything to do with their pumping. But Nobody's recalled it ever being that low ever, you know, prior to pumping, especially. So, you know, <laughs> only local stories can, that's not scientific data. So, you know, that's what we're looking at here locally. And I know that in Denmark too, um, during the drought of 2016, there were a lot of wells that gone dry, including farmer's wells who traditionally never gone dry even during drought, but again, uh, you know, these small farmers, they can't afford to go up against Nestle. And uh, along the shores of one of the ponds in Freiburg was showing a lot of signs of impact. And it was interesting that Nestle purchased the land where all the impact became obvious um, during that same time frame. You know, we can't say whether it was due to that or not, but a lot of townspeople were noticing and complaining. And then the land changed hands all of a sudden. So we're, you know, it's, that's unclear as to, yeah. So there's, there's a lot more questions <laughs> that come up with this than anything. So mm -hmm. does anybody want to raise Thank their you. hand or have another, does anybody have any other questions? Um, I think this is just a remarkable piece of, of research that you've done, Nikki, and I just can't thank you enough for this work. Uh, we, as a, you know, as a chapter in Nationally Sierra Club opposes using bottled water, but we clearly have to get more active in the state of Maine. And it seems that you, there needs to be a conversation with the revisor's office about how they could have re revised your bill to, to change it so dramatically. Um, that's really, yeah. So um, that's an, uh, you know, an interesting uh, twist. Um, yeah, it is. <laughs> right, because it came back saying that that would only be imposed on consumer owned utilities as though they wanted to protect the privately run utilities for some reason. And ooh, that's, that's really interesting. And that's something that we really need to examine. So, right. Yeah. That's, that's hugely problematic. We have a lot of work to do. I keep, I always think about the, you know, Native American, you know, um, meme that when you're drinking water, you're drinking water that has passed through all the generations of all of the animals and plants and people that have gone before us. Uh, since there's only always been 1% of potable water in the world, uh, it's remarkable that we take so little care of it. So <clears throat> I think the work that you're doing is incredible and uh, I hope we can support you in whatever we, way we can. Um, well, we'll be putting that bill in again for sure. And good. we'll have to stick it to right. them. Maybe time. we can make it an emergency bill for the second half of the session. You know um, that, yeah, if you're willing to do that, we can we can certainly well, try. Let's talk about doing that. Um, anybody else who on the, on the call who'd like to join in, um, in encouraging us to do that, please, uh, please feel free to join us though. So, um, right. And Nikki, do you want to put your, I don't have your email address up front. What's your email address? Well, uh, you can contact me at waterjustice1 at gmail.com. Okay. 
Yep. Waterjustice1 at gmail. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Well, thanks, everybody. Um, I actually have a hard stop right now. Um, so I'm going to have to go, but I just want to thank you so much, Nikki. And uh, this is recorded. So if any of you want to look at it again, uh, feel free to uh, go on our website. I, uh, maybe Anya can tell you how to find it. And I thank you. And I have to go. Okay, <laughs> yes, thank you so much. See you. Good to see you. <laughs> I hope to see you all before long. <laughs>